Hello, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Stethis again. Part 3. More experiments. Al became fascinated with the telegraph. The telegraph used electricity to send messages along wires. The messages were sent in Morse code, a system of dots and dashes. A dot is a short burst of electricity. A dash is a longer burst. A combination of dots and dashes stood for each letter. The messages were sent by tapping a telegraph key that made the dots and dashes. Telegraph messages were called lightning writing and were the fastest messages people had ever been able to send. When he was 11 years old, Al built his own telegraph machine from brass. He strung wire from tree to tree between his house and a friend's house. Al needed electricity to send messages. He looked in a book and discovered that he could make electricity by rubbing the fur on a cat backward. Al found two cats, hooked up their back legs to his wire, and rubbed their fur. The two cats did not like Al's idea. They spit at him and they clawed him. Then they ran to safety. Instead, Al used a battery for electricity. Soon, Al and his friend were slowly sending and receiving messages. The telegraph worked well until the day a cow ran into the wire and ruined their telegraph system. But Al had other experiments to try. Al needed more money to buy supplies. He and Michael Oates dug a large garden and planted onions, cabbages, lettuce, corn, beans, and peas. Al and Michael pulled a wagon around town selling their vegetables. Farming was hard, hot work. That fall, Al had money for more supplies. There's the cats. He even had enough to give some to his mother. When he was 12 years old, Al visited his sister Marion again. The railroad now reached Port Huron. Al rode the train to Detroit and then to Milan. At the end of Al's visit, Mr. Edison came to bring him home. They were taking many crates back with them. Al noticed that the boxes and crates were not well labeled. He found a brush and paint. Carefully, Al labeled the crates. The station master was so impressed with Al's work that he offered him a job. He would pay Al $30 a month, feed him, and give him a room if he would work for the railroad. Mr. Edison said Al was too young to be away from home. The idea of working on the railroad stayed with Al. Later that year, Al learned that the railroad needed a newsboy to sell papers to customers traveling from Port Huron to Detroit and back. Al begged his parents to let him have this job. He promised to spend his free time in Detroit reading at the library. Mrs. Edison reluctantly agreed. She worried that Al might be killed in a train wreck, but she knew that when Al made up his mind to do something, nothing could stop him. Al got the job. Working on the railroad. Al was called a news butch. He sold newspapers, candy, fruit, peanuts, postcards, books. He read them first. Magazines, sandwiches, soap, tea, coffee, and sugar. When the train reached Detroit, Al bought more newspapers and other supplies to sell on the return trip. Then the day was his to enjoy. Al wandered the streets of Detroit, the biggest city he had ever seen. He gazed at the buildings, and he stared in the shop windows. He pestered workmen with questions. I labeled over there. Detroit. He, Al remembered the promise he made to his mother to go to the library, where he explored the world of books. He said, I started with the first book on the bottom shelf and went through the lot, one by one. I didn't read a few books. I read the library. Al had started selling newspapers when more people began reading them. The Civil War had begun in 1861. People were anxious to find out war news. They were especially interested in the list of soldiers killed or wounded. Every day, Al sold many newspapers. One day, when he was 13, Al stopped by the Detroit Free Press to buy newspapers to sell. The paper was throwing out the old lead letters used to print the paper. To his surprise, Al was given the letters, ink, and paper, too. Al would print his own newspaper. He found an empty space in the baggage car on the train. There, Al printed his Weekly Herald newspaper. Al printed changes in the train schedules. He wrote stories and jokes, and he sold ads. He wrote about babies being born and people retiring. When printing on the swaying train proved too difficult, <clears throat> Al moved his newspaper into his basement workshop. Al's Weekly Herald cost three cents. He often sold 400 copies of his newspaper a day. He made enough money to pay his mother a dollar a day. In 1996, scientists digging in the basement of the Edison house also found 185 pieces of the type Al used to print his newspaper. Al used the space in the baggage car for more experiments. One day, when Al was 13 years old, an experiment set the baggage car on fire. 
Mr. Stevenson, the conductor, threw all of Al's equipment off the train. Then he boxed Al's ears before throwing him off the train, too. Al felt something snap inside his head. Mr. Stevenson had damaged Al's eardrums. Al's ears had already been hurt when he had scarlet fever. Mr. Stevenson hurt his ears even more. Now Al was almost deaf. He said that after that experience, he could not hear a bird sing. This unfortunate accident changed the path of Thomas Edison's life. When he was 14 years old, Al decided he wanted to be called Tom. Tom liked being around the train stations, particularly at Mount Clemens near Port Huron. Mount Clemens was a busy place. Mr. McKenzie, the station master at Mount Clemens, liked Tom Edison. He enjoyed the boy's curiosity and often let Tom listen to the loud clicks of the telegraph. One day when he was 15, Tom was at the station. Mr. McKenzie's three-year-old son, Jimmy, was playing in the gravel along the tracks. He did not see a train coming, but Tom did. Tom sprinted to Jimmy, grabbed him, and together they tumbled off the tracks. The grinding steel wheels missed both boys. Jimmy was crying, but he only had a few cuts. Tom had cuts, too. Mr. McKenzie wanted to reward Tom, but he didn't have any money. Knowing that Tom was fascinated with the telegraph, he offered to teach him how to be a telegraph operator. This was Tom's dream come true. Mr. McKenzie taught Tom for three months. Tom's goal was speed. He knew Morse code, and he wanted to be fast and accurate in sending and receiving messages. Tom discovered that because he was almost deaf, he had to feel the sounds with his fingers. He found that his ear problems blocked out noise so he could concentrate harder. Soon, Tom was able to write 45 words per minute in Morse code. When Tom had mastered the telegraph, he wanted a job using his new skill. Fortunately, Mr. Walker, a storekeeper, needed someone to work in his store where Western Union had a telegraph machine. Tom wanders and wonders. Tom liked Mr. Walker's store. He sold books, clocks, watches, china, rifles, organs, and science magazines. When Tom wasn't busy with the telegraph, he was free to read and think. Wanting to improve himself, Tom learned how to read faster by grouping words together. After dinner, Tom returned to the store to receive more messages on the telegraph. When he was not working, reading, or thinking, Tom took naps on a cot. Tom liked working at night. Since he didn't need much sleep, he could work at night and read and experiment during the day. Thomas Edison had this habit all his life. Whenever he could, Tom rode in the train engines. He watched engineers work the gouges. He observed the firemen keeping the steam up in the boiler. He asked questions. One day, 14-year-old Tom was riding in the engine of a freight train. The engineer and fireman were sleepy, so they told Tom he could run the engine while they took naps. Tom ran the train for 20 miles when suddenly a shower of muddy ash and black soot exploded from the smokestack. Tom was covered in black soot from head to foot. The explosion didn't wake up the engine or the, the fireman. Tom kept the train going. Then the smokestack belched ash and soot a second time. Tom, the dirty engineer, safely took his train all the way to town. Tom grew bored with his work in Mr. Walker's store. He wanted more of a challenge and more pay. While he was looking for a new job, Tom's skills as a telegrapher came in handy. The winter of 1864, when Tom was 17 years old, was especially bitter. Ice on the St. Clair River broke the telegraph cable connecting Port, Port Huron with Sarnia, Canada. The ice was so thick that even the ferry boats could not cross. The two towns could not communicate. Tom had an idea. A train could be parked by the river on the Port Huron side. The train engineer could then blow his whistle in Morse code. The long and short blast of the whistle quickly got the attention of the people in Sarnia. They had a train come down on their side of the river. Before long, the two engines were whistling messages back and forth between the United States and Canada. Tom's fast thinking got the attention of the railroad owners. When Tom applied for a telegrapher's job 75 miles away in Stratford Junction, Canada, the railroad owners gave it to him. Tom worked from 7 at night until 7 in the morning. These hours suited Tom perfectly. Even better, he would be paid $25 a month. At first, his parents were reluctant to let Tom leave home, but they knew they could not stand in his way. Besides, the Edisons were from Canada, 
and Stratford Junction wasn't very far away. Tom packed his few belongings and moved to Canada. He was pleased to be on his own and worked hard at his new job, becoming a skilled knight of the telegraph key. But as usual, Tom's attentions wandered once he had mastered something. The long nights were very boring when there weren't many messages. Each night, at certain times, a signal was sent to Tom to make sure he was awake. Tom knew when the signal was coming, so he asked the night watchman to wake him if he was sleeping. One night, the signal came, but the night watchman failed to wake Tom. A freight train came roaring down the track from one direction. Another train rumbled from the opposite direction. The two trains barely missed crashing into each other. Tom was immediately fired. He went home in disgrace. He only stayed a little while, however, because he soon found another job on a different railroad in Adrian, Michigan. Tom's skills were so valuable that he could get a job almost anywhere. Now he was paid $75 a month. Once again, Tom liked the night shift. He stayed in Adrian for a few months, then moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana. He worked there for six months before moving to Indianapolis, Indiana. Then, Tom left the railroads to work for the Western Union Telegraph Company. And I'll stop there, boys and girls, and we'll finish it up tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye.